Welcome to another night in Great Neck. For those who don't know, we gave uh, in the last uh, three months maybe 30 lectures in Great Neck. Uh, we have activities here for the young guys and for the girls. And we do lectures in houses and in synagogues. And the idea behind all these lectures is to bring our brother and sisters closer to Hashem, because every Jew has a pure soul. Sometimes a diamond falls into the mud. When you pick it up, it doesn't look like a diamond anymore. And it's still a very expensive diamond. Every one of us has a soul. Some of us got a little bit dirtier than the other in the mud. And our job is to clean the sand to make it shiny like it was in a creation of the soul, it was pure, crystal pure, 100%. For those who are not aware, we are six days before Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of a new year, a new Jewish year. Rosh Hashanah is Adam's birthday. Adam was created in the sixth day of the creation. And that means today, actually, we are six days before Adam's birthday, it's the creation of the world. Six days later is Adam's birthday, he was created in a sixth day. And then God decided that since Adam's birthday is on Rosh Hashanah, it's the beginning of the year, then it's going to be also the judgment day. The judgment day, people don't like to hear the word judgment, nobody likes this word. But we have to also realize that when reality is reality, you have to face it. You cannot ignore it. Ignoring reality is definitely not a smart thing to do. For those of you who are having doubts if the Torah is the word of God, then I please ask you to enter my website. It's called divineinformation.com. I have my cards here if you want. I can give it to you. And I have 400 lectures over there. And maybe at least good 30 or 40 of them are proving scientifically that the Jewish Torah, it's the only divine book in the history. I see a lot of faces here and a lot of new faces here. I will give an introduction before we start the actual lecture. Uh, the only book that can be proven scientifically that it can never be written by a human being is our Torah. Quran, the New Testament, Buddhism, all these religions that came way after Judaism started, it takes about five minutes maximum to prove that it's false, that God never gave those books. And the rule is very simple. If you find one mistake in a book, that shows right away it's not from God. God doesn't make foolish mistakes. The mistakes that appear in the Quran and in the New Testament indicates that a person in the level of first grade, in Jewish yeshiva, first grade, wrote those books. Not, I'm not exaggerating. You can watch the lectures and you will agree with me, I promise you. People that had very limited knowledge in Judaism claim that God gave a continuation to his religion. First, the Christians did it 2,000 years ago, and it's full of errors, full of contradictions. They never contradicted the Torah. They admit that the Jews received the Torah from God in front of millions of witnesses 3,320 years ago. Since they claim that God gave part two and part three, in that case, it has to comply 100%. Please, I have guests from LA, please have a seat. It's good to see you. No, no, you be close to me, I missed you. Yeah. All right, so, very good. So, since the Goim never contradicted that the Torah is the word of God, they just claim he gave another book, in that case, in that case, their books have to comply 100% with the Torah. And since it contradicts the Torah in so many different subjects and so many different pages, it leaves no doubt that it's not the word of God. You should know that uh, my, my 
accidentally, you know, nothing is accident, it's all by uh, the supervision of God, accidentally many, many goyim, non-Jews, discover my website. And you know how it is in the internet. Once you have ten goyim that knows about it, then you have millions. And the website started to, to do very well, you know, because the goyim, you have millions all over the world. So now in 45 countries, we have non-Jews watching the, we the, the, the website. In the beginning, I was a little bit nervous, because when you show a guy that his belief is false, he gets even angrier. But the truth is, I'm very surprised that many of them send positive emails, and tens of them wants to convert. It's so easy to convert a non-Jew when he sees the truth. Right away, he begins to send emails, making phone calls, sending letters, begging, I want to come to New York, where can I buy? I have a Muslim guy send me... I think he's Muslim by the name. He sent me a request this week. Do I have permission to buy the Torah with the English translation? And which parts of the Torah I'm allowed to learn? Since I learned in your lecture that the Torah was given to the Jews only, and God is not interested that the non-Jews will learn it free. So in that case, please tell me which parts I'm allowed to learn or not. That means he's already in such a level, he doesn't want to get God angry by learning Torah. You understand the point? So I had to write him a list of the request. He agreed with us. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so since Adam was created in Rosh Hashanah, and actually today we are six days before, it's the creation of the world, it's a very special day. We have the merit to do a lecture on the birthday of the creation of the world. According to Judaism, the world is 5,768 years old. Soon it's going to be 69. If you have doubts that the world is so young, go into my website. There are two movies by American scientists that proves that the world is only a few thousand years old. After you watch those, I, the reason I put them in my website to save myself the headache of repeating it hundreds of times. You just watch what the Goim scientists are showing, and you know the world is only a few thousand years old, and everything else that they say, billions and trillions, it's all an assumption, estimation, they're guessing, they're assuming, speculation. Let's start the lecture. Rosh Hashanah is a very, very special day. In six days from now, God is going to sign on the file of each one of us. Us, our wives, husbands, children, parents, friends, teachers, everyone you connect with is going to get a verdict in six days from now. I said in my last few lectures here in Great Neck in the last two weeks, for some Jews, unfortunately, Rosh Hashanah, it's a picnic day. They live in such spiritual darkness that they're doing a shish kebab on Tiberia, on the beach there, and they're not even aware that in this moment God is deciding their eternity. What's going to be for the next year? Are they going to get married or are they going to die single? Are they going to make money enough to, so, to support their family or are they going to beg people to lend them money and to get all the embarrassment? Are they going to be healthy or are they going to join millions of people who suffer from all kinds of sicknesses. Are they going to be successful in their private life? They're going to be happy? Or they're going to be mentally depressed every moment of their life? Anger, frustration, all kinds of depression. There's millions of people who suffer from depression. It's not in their hand. All kinds of things like this. This is all going to be determined in six days from now. <coughs> Six days from now, the entire year, what we went through, is going to be reviewed, and every one of us is going to get a mark. How much charity we did this year? How much kindness? How many guests we brought into our house? How nice we behave to our wives, to the children? How much we invest in the children? How honest we were in a business? How did we keep the Sabbath? Or oh, we didn't, God forbid. All these things is going to be reviewed. Now a person is going to get a mark. Not necessarily that the verdict is going to affect us immediately. Some people will see right away the anger of God a week after Rosh Hashanah, an hour after. It could be a month after. It can be 30 years after. God has a lot of patience. When he rewards a person, or God forbid he punishes a person, it doesn't happen immediately. 
is not a person that reacts out of anger. That means right now I'm angry, I have to hit my son because right now he got me angry. An hour later, I won't have any need to hit him because I'll be very relaxed and happy in a good mood. So right now, because I'm angry, I'm hitting him, which means it's not education. It's just taking the anger out of somebody, and he was the victim, passing by. It was really nothing to do with him. A person is angry for one reason, he blames somebody else. That's not the way God runs the world. Everything is calculated. Trillions of things are taken into consideration before a person receives something or before a person loses something. When we review the Tanakh, we learn a lot from King Solomon. King Solomon was the smartest person ever lived. Three books in the Tanakh come from the words of King Solomon. One of them names Kohelet, one Mishlei, and Shir Hashirim, three major books. We learn a lot, a lot about the supervision of God in the creation from those books. His name was Kohelet. Kohelet in Hebrew means gathering, gathering people together. King Solomon was the king in Jerusalem for 37 years. And those years were the best times, the best time in the history of the Jewish nation. Because he was not only the king of Jerusalem, in the beginning of his kingdom, when he was only 12 years old, later he became the king of the world. And then later on, he started to lose from his kingdom. Then he became the king of Israel only, and then only the king of Jerusalem. And then the end of his life, everybody know, it's written right there in the Tanakh. The Torah, the Tanakh, is very objective. All the positives are there and all the negatives are there. There's no other religion that writes negative things about the heroes, only Judaism. In Judaism, you read all the good about Moshe Rabbeinu, you read the negative comments about him. The same thing King David, King Solomon, all the heroes of the Jewish history, you know everything about them. Whether it was good, whether it was bad, it's right there because it's the book of God. Other religion that people like me and you wrote it, those crooks who wrote those books were not interested to be their agenda. They had an agenda. If they write something negative about Muhammad or about J.C. Penny, it's going to ruin their purpose. It's going to defeat their purpose. What's the point? I want to make him the hero, the god of the world, and I'm going to write that he's a crook. I'm going to write that he's lazy. I'm going to write that he's, he's cursing. I'm going to write all kinds of things that he was limited? Of course not. That's not my agenda. But in Judaism, you see reality as it is. King Solomon, in the years that he was there, he was gathering all the people. They came to Jerusalem for the holidays. He was speaking, and tens of thousands of people came to hear him. Not only that, once every seven years, the Torah said that the king gathered the nation, and they're reviewing the Torah together that in case somebody copied that wrong, now it's the opportunity to examine all the copies and make sure if somebody made a mistake, they're going to correct it. That's why we are the only religion, the only, that has the authentic, the original copy of our book stay the same 3,320 years later, even though the Jews were all over the world, they were spread all over, Everybody ran after us. Everyone was interested to defeat and destroy our religion. But we have the original copy. And the Christians and the Muslims, the Muslims have hundreds of Korans, different texts. And the Christians have more than 150,000 different texts to the New Testament. Why? Because people were making a lot of mistakes while they copy the books. King Solomon writes in his book, Et kol ma'aseh ha'elokim yavi b'mishpat. Everything Hashem created from the beginning of the world to the end is going to be judged. Al kol ne'elam, for all the past, from the creation of the world until this particular moment, im tov ve'im ra, whether for good, whether for bad. Now we all understand that if a person does something bad, there's a reason to judge him. But if a person does something good, if a person does something good, what's the point of judging him? The answer is because when a person does something good, it has to be reviewed. Maybe he could have done it a hundred times better. He could have done it a lot better. Plus, every person that does something, whether it's good or bad, the good for me could be bad for him. 
what's good for him can be bad for me. Depend on the unique purpose of each individual in this life. I'll give you an example. Avraham Avinu, the famous Abraham, he was the number one in the history of hosting guests. His house was open to four directions, 24 hours a day. Anyone who wanted a place to sleep and to eat, free of charge, hotel, five stars hotel, is going into Abraham's house and eats for free. All he had to do is to bless God for giving the food. That was the condition. Abraham, as the Torah describes him, God says there was a very kind man, the symbol of the chesed, of the kindness. He had a nephew, his name was Lot. Lot was his nephew. Abraham was 99 years old when he finally had Yitzchak. All these years he was walking frustrated that he doesn't have a son. He is desperate to have one kid at least, one kid that's going to inherit all his trillions. He was the richest man. The Goim called Abraham, you are the president, the representative of God among us, as the Torah described, that they told him. He bought the cave in Hebron from Ephron Achiti. It was a big building, as you can see today in Hebron, when Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the four mothers of the Jewish nation are buried. The three fathers of the Jewish nation and the four mothers give us the word Israel, Yud, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Yud. Shin, Sarah, Resh, Rachel, and Rivka, Aleph, Abraham, Lamed, Leah. Three, fath three fathers and the four mothers giving us the word Israel. It starts with Yud and finish with Lamed. Yud is the smallest letter in the alphabet. Lamed is the largest. To show, to hint that the life of the Jew starts in this life with lots of problems and lots of miseries. But when he's going to finish this life, if he listens to God, he is going, pointing up to the upper worlds to get, to cash out his reward. That's why the word Israel is starting from the smallest and growing to the end. The word Israel means also honest with God. Yashar El, straight with God. God ordered each one of us, Tamim Tiyeim Hashem Elokecha. You be complete with your relationship with me, God says. You have to be complete. A person is not judged based on quantity of his mitzvot. It's important quantity. The more you do, the more you get, of course. But sometimes it's better to do less complete or to do a lot not complete. If a person makes a million mitzvot but each one of them is defected, or a person made half a million mitzvot but each, each one of them is perfect, the one who did less but perfect is in a much higher level. The Alachai in Shulchan Aruch says that if a person wants to get bread to make bracha on the bread, and he has a lot of pieces that are cut off, not complete. They're ripped from the bread. Many, many pieces. He has large quantity of pieces of bread. Rather, he has one almost stale piece of bread, but complete, with no holes in it, not cut, not, nothing tear off from that piece. He's going to make the bracha. This is the law. He has to make the bracha for the complete piece of bread, even though it could be smaller, it can be not as fresh as the other ones, but it's complete. This is a hint that God is telling us, I'm looking for performance. Do it in a right way. Better a little bit with attention when you pray than a lot when you think about your business. Now, now, the Torah complements Abraham about his hospitality, bringing guests into his house and doing a lot for them. His nephew, Lot, described in the Torah that one time he had three angels coming into his house. Angels look like people. They come with a custom. They look like normal person. And they come when Lot moved to Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah is like you say today, San Francisco or New Orleans. More or less in the same idea. So now imagine Rabbi Ovadia Yosef decide to move to New Orleans. It's going to be a shock to the entire world. Or one of the biggest rabbi you admire decided to move to San Francisco, to the village. You know, to, what's the name of those streets there with all the bars? He decided to live there. Comes out with his talit and feeling when all the people running around in the street, two o'clock at night. This is more or less what Lord did. He went to the most 
corrupted city in history, Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom, that later were destroyed with millions of people there. As he's there, he has three visitors coming to visit him. Those visitors were inside the house, which, we, which is against the law in Sodom. Over there, it's against the law to have guests. They were very evil people. Somebody got caught having guests in that city. They taking off his clothes and put him in the street as a punishment for daring to bring foreigners into his house. This is the law of Sodom. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah, they come and they try to get the guests out because they want to rape them. Homosexuality for the first time in the Torah described in this parasha. When you check this chapter in the Torah with a computer, the computer have equal mathematical codes of the word AIDS inside that parasha that accidentally or not speaking about homosexuality. They want to rape the guests. Lot says, take me instead. They say, no, we don't want you. Say, take my daughters. They say, no, thank you. Only the guests. They're not giving up. Later, when they were about to break the house to pieces, the angels took out mirrors and blinded them. And that moment, God decided that this place will be cleaned, destroyed completely. He decided that first they came to say to Lot to get ready to leave. And the question that we have is very interesting. Lot was willing to sacrifice his life, the life of his children, to save three foreigners he just met an hour ago. He never saw them before. People come, knock on your door, we're looking for a place to stay. Can you have us until tomorrow? You're willing to die for them? Why should you do such a thing? You're willing to give your daughter for the, for the people outside? Who would do such a thing? If you would find today somebody that's willing to give his wife or his daughter or himself to the public to protect three foreigners that he never saw, is giving his life, somebody like this is righteous or wicked? Very righteous, no? Wow. What sacrifice is willing to make? The Torah says, believe it or not, for this great act, Lot received almost no reward. What's the merit of the nephew of Abraham that the Mashiach, the Messiah, is coming from his descendants? His grand-grand-granddaughter, his name is Ruth, Ruth the Moavia. She converted, and David Amelech is her grandson. So Ruth the Moavia, from her, Mashiach will come. It's not a joke here. We're talking a huge reward he got. That the Messiah comes from, her, from, from his family. Chazal teaching us that when Lot went with Abraham, the reason he joined him is to protect his inheritance. There was no telephone, no lawyers that call you. Hey, your uncle died. Come collect your inheritance. No telephone, no internet, no FedEx, no ways to communicate. He is going somewhere in a desert. Perhaps you'll never see him until the day of your, of your death. That's it. You want to protect your money, you make sure to be close to your father or to your uncle, because if not, somebody else, when he dies, take everything he has. Plus, remember, there was no Citibank, there was no Wachovia, no Washington Mutual, that they're all going bankrupt anyway, but there was no banks. So a person had what he owned with him. If you had a million dollars in those days, you bought camels and cows, and every uh, gold, some, you know, material, something that you carry with you. You have slaves, servants, you, they all go with you. If you die and you have no kids and nobody there to claim what you have, all the people from the area will come and get what they want. And here you go. Whatever you save all your life is gone. So Lot wanted to protect his future. That's why he's working with Avram for years. And then Avram come to Egypt. Pharaoh asked him, who is this gorgeous girl? At Sarah, the most beautiful woman, one of four most beautiful women ever lived, Sarah Imenu. Amazing beauty. Cannot look at her and not be amazed. And he said, this is my sister. He doesn't want to say that she's his wife. Then he says, later they come and say, why did you lie? This is your wife. So he said, because when there is no fear from God in a place, it's very dangerous. If I would say she's my wife, yeah, they will kill me right away to get her for me. What do we learn from this? 
that even in the worst situation, in those old days when the people were so wicked and evil in Egypt, this Goim, they were, they were better than some of us. Today, in the world, there are many, many people who make sins with married lady. It became a fashion. Thousands, tens of thousands cheat on their husbands. They like modern life. What, what's the problem, Rabbi? Let's enjoy life. The filthiest people on earth, the Torah says, if they want to get Sarah, they will murder Abraham, but they will not touch a married woman. This is it. He says, if I would say she's my wife, a week later I'll be dead. So what's the point? He said, this is his sister. Lot is standing right next to him. He's wondering, what is he saying? This is his wife. Why say that she's his sister? All he had to do and say, excuse me, uncle, you just made a mistake. She's your wife. She's not your sister. And that will be the end of Abraham. And he will inherit all his billions or millions, whatever he had, right away. And he was dying to talk, but he was holding his words. And because of that, the life of Abraham got saved, and he had to wait for his inheritance for a long, long time. The Torah said that for this moment, one moment of his life, one moment, that he was silent, he got the reward that Mashiach will be his grandson. Right, so now, now Chazal asks, wait a minute, we have a big issue here. He is sacrificing his life and his daughter and everything. He has to leave his place. Who knows what's going to be out of it? And he got almost nothing for that. And here, because he was standing one minute silent for that, his life got saved and Mashiach is going to come from him. Where is the logic? Comes the Torah and say, yes, a person doesn't judge by what he does. He judge by his mission in life and his potential. How much from his potential he achieved. One person finished the entire Torah. The other person finished only half. The one that finished half could be better than the one who finished the whole Torah. Why? He was born with much higher skills, much greater talent. The one who learned half worked a lot harder. It doesn't go by your achievement. It's go by how much from your potential you fulfill. If your potential is 80% and you did 60, you did three quarter. If your potential is 100 and you did 70, 70 is more than 60. You are less than the other person. Why? <coughs> he made a greater achievement. Lot was born and raised in a house when every second guest coming in and eating for free for years. Since he's a kid, his uncle raised him. Guests are coming non-stop to the house. This is in your genes. For that, you don't deserve reward. You grew up like this. There's no other way for you. You don't know any other way. But you were very greedy. You follow your uncle that maybe he'll die and you get all his millions and you had the money in your hand. And you say, no, I won't tell on him, even though I want the money very much, I will hold my words, and for that he got a huge reward. Comes the Torah and says like this, God says to the Jews and says like this, Azman Katsar, time is short, and there's a lot of work to be done, the workers are lazy, and the owner is pushing them to wake up. And what's the secret of all this? The time is very short. Nobody knows how much he's going to live. 40 years, 50 years, 70 years. Before you realize, it's like a blink of the eye. A person remembers that he was a little kid, two, three years old. He used to go to the doctors. He still remember. 30, 40 years ago. Before you realize, life is over. It looks long. But look back, it flew like a second. The, the Chazal say the life is like a blink of the eye. How you blink about 10, 20 times a minute, you don't even feel it. You blink, it's over. Right? How many times a person blink? Did he ever stop to think how many times I blink in a moment? Imagine if every time you blink it would be five seconds. You go like this and open. Couldn't drive. You couldn't do anything. Life will be over. It has to be less than a second. 
because more than a second, it's a life risk. You blink so many times, not once in your life you thought, how many times I'm blinking? You need it for your life. That's how life is. A blink of the eye, and it's over. But right now, it looks very long. God says, the life is short. The work is tremendous. There's a lot to achieve. And you, my Jewish kids, are very lazy, you live in a dream, you live in illusion, you think you came here to eat Gondi and to go to Mexico to vacations and Israel three times a year and to buy nice clothes and diamonds and nice car and nice chandelier. You think this is the reason I created you? You are very busy working full time around the clock, killing yourself to have another chandelier and another car and another house, and another yacht, and another diamond. It's never enough. And in the end, you forget the real job that you had to do. Just imagine a person gets permission to enter the place where they print the dollars in Washington there. They print dollars nonstop, hundreds. Collect as much as you want, my friend. Bring your bags, bring your boxes. Just grab as much as you can. He light a cigarette. Okay, thank you. See, it smokes, call his wife on the cell phone. You're not going to believe where I am. Then, a minute before, a second before time is up, the light begins to blink. What's this? That means you have 10 seconds left. Oh, 10 seconds. He throws the phone, the cigarette, he runs, he collected $5,000. Then he comes out, his friends say, look, I have $2 million cash in a bag. And he say, I have 5000 How come? We went in together. You're a fool and I'm not. We all collected only $5,000 in the best scenario. We are very far away from how much we can collect. Now what's the reason that we are not aiming on the reason for our creation? One reason, we're ignorant. We never read the Torah, so we don't know what's the mission. Second, some of us have doubts. Who knows, maybe the rabbi made up a beautiful story. Today the president of Iran spoke in the United Nations 99% of his speech was about God creation and the purpose of life. Did you hear that? Every two words was God, God, God put us here, the world is limited, the world is going to be end soon, but the person lives for eternity. God expects us this. Almost, I almost felt that I'm in a Gemara shiur. <laughs> Maybe he's listening to my lectures on the website. He prepared good. I almost copy his lecture and play it for you. What's the difference? He copy everything from the Torah anyway. Whatever they say, what do you think? All the positive things they say in the mosque, you should not kill, you should not steal, who taught them? Why they call themselves Ibrahim, Yusuf, Yusuf, where all these names come from? From the Torah. Why they scream in Hebron, they demonstrate in the grave of Yosef, the grave of Rachel, what, what, what does it have to do with them? The Torah says it's holy, we are there. The Torah said the Western world is holy, that was the Beta Mikdash, that's where we're going to make the mask. The Torah say Chazir, it's filthy, pig, we don't touch pig. The Torah say you're not allowed to take interest from your brother, we're also not going to take interest. The Torah say eye for an eye, in Saudi, in Saudi Arabia it's eye for an eye, a hand for a hand. They don't have the oral laws, they translate it literally as the written Torah said, they don't know the secrets of the Torah, but they try to do it. They try to do what the Torah says. Why? They witness the Jews receiving the Torah. The Torah says, go and learn from the end. I'm sure when you have sugar falls in your kitchen on the floor, what happened an hour later? Hundreds of ants coming to enjoy the sugar or the honey. They walk. Did you ever see how hard the ants are working to collect breadcrumbs, how much they work, who knows what's the life of an ant, how long an ant lives, how long, six months, that's it, the life of an ant, six months, the ant, King Solomon says, Lech el atzel, lazy, go learn from the ant, how not to be lazy. Re'ed rachea vechacham. Follow for a few minutes. Follow the way of the end and become wiser. That's going to teach you a lot in life. 
The Gemara says in Masechet Erubim, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, it's page 18. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan says, if we would not receive the book of God, we would have to learn the purpose of the creation, the purpose of our life, from the animals, from the, from the cat, from the dog, from the rooster. Each animal has one unique thing about it, that if you take it out of it and you learn from it, it's going to be very positive for your life. God made it much easier for us. He gave us the book of the Torah. Torah means instruction. Torah means in Hebrew instruction, oraah. And everything is there. If we wouldn't have the Torah, if we were intelligent enough to investigate, each animal will teach us something. For instance, the eagle, the eagle is praised for being light and being fast. The eagle is the heaviest bird. There are birds who are faster than the eagle. But the Mishnah took the eagle as a symbol of flying fast. Why? Because it's very heavy. If you light and you fly fast, what's the point? You light. It's easy. When you're very heavy like the eagle and you fly so fast, you deserve reward for that. So the Torah teaching us. The Torah told us, be brave like a tiger, like a leopard. The Torah says... When you have relation with your wife, you develop relationship with her, learn from the chicken, from the roosters. Each animal has something unique about it. The dog, when he goes to the bathroom, they, the dog and the cat, they cover it. Not like some people in a subway. They do in the middle of millions of people, and they don't even care, or the highway. They don't care. They're worse than the animals without Torah. Each one of the animals teaching us something. The end teaching us to be hardworking people. The end collects so much more than what it needs for its life. Even though now the end has enough to live for six months, it continues to work around the clock non-stop. Maybe I'll live longer. So, go to the end lazy and learn from the way she functions. As long as the person is alive, he can correct. But he can also make it worse. A person can make it worse. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God, made in the Torah few titles to few important people. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God never called his name after a person that is still alive. Only someone who died already and he died righteous... God named himself after that person, the God of Abraham, when? After he died. The God of Jacob, when? After he finished his mission. You proved yourself, you deserve that I'm going to make my name after you. There's only one person that had the merit that God called himself the God of Isaac in his lifetime. Isaac. Why? When? After he became blind. The Torah says, When Yitzchak became blind, God said, Okay, you're blind, you're not going to make sins anymore. That's it. Why? What makes a person make all the sins? His eyes. That's what we say in Shema Israel. The eye see all the things around. Ladies, non-kosher food, places to go, to waste time, to do bad things against God. It all starts with the eyes. Person become blind, his desire, his evil inclination is minimized to almost nothing. Only after he became blind, Hashem agreed to call himself the God of Isaac, even though there's always a chance that he's going to become wicked. Some people can be righteous all their life. In the last year of their life, something went wrong, and God already named himself after that person. It's a big embarrassment. The God of this person, and all of a sudden he became wicked. So the Torah says... The only one that God called himself after is Isaac. What we learn from this, don't trust yourself until the last second of your life. You don't know. You could be Shomer Shabbos 50 years. Something goes wrong, you're not careful, you lose your level. You go down. You can be righteous 80 years, you died 82, the last two years you ruin everything. One bad thing you did sometimes can make you lose almost all your life. Or the other way around. Sometimes a person does one thing 
and it saves his entire life. I'll give you an example. When a person is a murderer, if a person comes to court now in the United States or in Israel, usually he gets life in prison after he kills someone. I want to ask you a question. When a person killed a 20 years old young guy, when a person killed a person 119 years old, is it going to be a different punishment or it's a murder and that's it, it's life in prison? No difference whether you killed an old person, whether you killed a young person, there's no really difference. I would think it's more logical that they have to take the average life term of a person and calculate how many years of his life you shorten and based on that decide your punishment. If you kill the person that was anyway in five hours he's gonna die, you just disconnect his oxygen in the hospital because you felt bad for him, it's still a murder. It's against the law. If you did that, you're a murderer. What's the point, judge? What did I do? I took five hours of his life. You're blaming me like somebody who killed a two years old baby? He took eight years of his life. I took five years of his life. How can it be the same punishment? What's the message here? Also the Torah. According to the Torah, a murderer gets executed. No life in prison. Death, if he did it on purpose. So whether he killed a person an hour before his death, or a hundred years before his death, both of them get execution. Why? God wants to teach us a very important message. One minute in the life of a Jew can save the entire world. What a person can do in one minute, there's no end to it. There's no end to it. I'll give you an example. A person come to your house. Today I had a case like this. One Israeli guy came, somebody brought him to the yeshiva. Accidentally, they passed in the yeshiva. I spoke to the guy 10 minutes. 10 minutes. 10 minutes on the clock. 10 minutes. I was very busy to go to Mincha. Quarter to two, I had to go to Mincha. It was 1.30 when they walked through the door. Ten minutes I spoke to him, he started to have tears. I convinced him to stay in yeshiva. There was no room in yeshiva, Baruch Hashem. Packed. All the beds, all the room, packed to the limit. After I finally was so happy that in ten minutes we save a soul of a Jew, that now he's going to learn Torah and open up his eyes, I got a phone call, there's no room for him. What are we going to do? <laughs> Started to make phone calls, maybe somebody in his room has an extra bed until Yom Kippur, until we see what we're going to do. Then I had an idea, I called somebody in Brooklyn, he said, oh, don't worry, somebody is leaving today, he has to go. That person left, that guy got his bed. On the way here, I got a phone call. So now, you do not know what's going to come out of it, but from experience, I tell you, that sometimes you speak to a guy, you made him religious, and that's it, you forgot about him. That minute, or five, or ten minutes, was already worded for you more than another Jew that lived 70 years. That would be better. Why? Because earning, earning wise, making one Jew religious will bring you more income than 70 years of keeping mitzvot by yourself. It's him, his children, grandchildren, grand, grand, grand. The best investment you can make. You made one or two Jews in your life religious. You brought them to some lectures. You gave them some CD, CDs. You sponsor CDs, whatever the case was. That was already a greater achievement than your friend that goes 70 years to synagogue to make mitzvot every day on his own. You already passed him in one minute. There are cases in the Gemara, the Gemara, say that, the Gemara says that there's a person, the Gemara named few people that earned heaven in one minute. One of the Chachamim, we, we, in Tisha B'Av, we cry for the ten Chachamim that were killed. One of them, they said that the Romans took the Sefer Torah and surround his body with the Sefer Torah. In between his body to the Sefer Torah, they put curtains soaked with water, and they light the Sefer Torah with the curtains to burn him with the Torah, but they put water that it's going to take longer for him to die, that he should suffer another two, three minutes. That's how evil they were. The Roman, the soldier that did it, he knew that the Jews were the holy people. He has an order from his commander. What can he do? So the Gemara says, he told them, Rabbi, if I'll take away the curtain and make the fire higher, you take me with you to the world of eternity? 
He told him yes. Right away, he burned him alive and jumped into the fire, the Goy. The Gemara said that Goy, in one minute, did what we probably won't do in 120 years. One minute. The Gemara says there were cases in, this, in the Gemara that some Goyim did something for the Jews, and in one minute they earned what the Jews cannot earn probably in 100 years. And Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, the most perfect Jew in his generation, the biggest Chacham, he wrote the Mishnah, he was the richest guy in a Jewish nation in the world. He has servants, his table was all pure gold. Very long, full of all the best things on earth. And he's the biggest Chacham, and he lived 120 years. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, the legendary Chacham. And one guy, his name Ktiya Bar Shalom, he argued with the king for the sake of the Jews and won the argument. The king wanted to destroy the Jews. He convinced him that it's not going to be a smart thing to do. They killed him. Moments before he got killed, he circumcised himself. And Rabbi Yehuda Nasi started to cry and say, while I, don't, while I couldn't reach in 120 years, this guy got in less than a few minutes. Yes, Adam kone olamo berega echad. Sometimes a person goes, he puts a tape in his... He puts a tape in his car. One minute, what the rabbi just said over there, woke up his soul. From this moment, he'll never be the same. I have a cousin. He was a, an officer in the Israeli army. Very successful. He has a driver, private car, important uh, officer in the army. Once he was driving in a car and he put a tape in. The rabbi there say. A person can live all his life in a big mistake, and the sad part is that he's not even aware of it. The surprise that he's going to have when he finishes this life will be unbelievable. No way to explain the, the sorrow and the pain and the disappointment that that person will have when he finds out that 80 years he lived here, ate, ran around, danced, went to work, sports, Sleeping, waking up, doctors, marriage, kids, college. So everything he did in his life, God says to him, not one minute of your life you did what I wanted you to do. Eight years in your life was all mistake. When he heard that, he got very nervous. What did he say? If this rabbi is right, he had no knowledge in Judaism at all. If this rabbi is right, I am finished. I am the most miserable guy on earth, because he's talking about me, if he's right. So what's my job now? I want to go and challenge him. I want to see if he's right. Let me see if he's right. I want to make sure that he's wrong, because if he's right, how can I cook myself such a poison? If he's wrong, I can relax, go back to my life. But if he's right, how can I live in a lie? Eventually I have to return to what I lose. I have to go to the zero point. I'm going in negative, negative. I'm thinking I'm earning money. I'm actually losing. You think you made a million dollars? In reality, you actually lost. You just don't know yet. A year later, you find out. It was all for nothing, this investment. And this cousin today is one of the important rabbis in the world from this moment of the tape. Big Kabbalist, big Talmud Chacham, write books in Kabbalah. Why? One minute of the tape. Change his entire life. Just imagine if we wouldn't hear it. He could be probably today a big officer in the army. No Lamaba, no, no part of the world to come. Not Shomer Shabbos, live like a goy, eat non kosher. What? A minute can wake up a soul of a person and save not only, only his life, his eternity. His entire eternity. You know, when a person has evil inclination, yetzerara, desires, the way of the Satan is to blind the person. It gets to a point that a person cannot decide what's good, what's bad. That's how bad he can get. That for the things that it's good, he decides it's bad. The thing that is bad, he decides that it's good. I'll give you an example. Look at the Israeli government. The Israeli government, every time there is a tragedy in the world, who is the first country offered aid, trucks, medicine, blankets, as volunteers to go as an earthquake? Even in Iran, 
Iran that announced that they are waiting for the second that they're going to have a bomb to destroy the state of Israel. Every week they're announcing it. Nowhere in the history a nation announced almost every week clearly we are going to destroy Israel. Nowhere. Even Hitler didn't announce such a thing. It happened in a slow process. Another process, another step, and another. They come from the beginning. This is our dream. They had an earthquake, 70,000 people died there. Israel begged them, Let, help, help us to help you. Let, open the border that we can send volunteers and money for you to help you. And a minute later, they take the food from the mount of the rabbis to, to starve them and their children. Now they won't have what to eat. A minute later, the Gemara says, if you have mercy for the wicked people, guarantee you're going to be cruel for the righteous people. Guarantee. Because God cannot stand hypocrite. Oh, you feel bad for them? Why don't you feel bad for your brothers in Bnei Brak and Yerushalayim? They have seven, eight, nine kids. They live in one bedroom apartment. They don't have bread to eat before they go to eat the, the kids. Why don't you give the millions that you just offer Hitler and, uh, and, and Iran, why didn't you take these few million dollars and give it to the poor people in Israel? They're worse than them? Okay, your ideology is different than the religious people. You don't care about the Torah. You hate the Sabbath. Whatever the case is, you have to agree that they are not as bad as them, no? Why you want to help them? Why you want to help Pakistan? Why you want to help any country, China, whatever, when your own brothers are dying? Why you don't help them? Same thing America. Every country in the world gets help from America, for whatever reasons, and the people of America, more than 80% of them, don't have enough money to finish the months. What's going on? That's what the Torah says. The Satan blinds a person. You have mercy for the wicked people? No problem. That's what you chose. You don't have the right to have mercy on the right people. Why? Because you're going to get a huge reward for that. I'm not interested to give you reward. Go help the miserable, the crooks, the, the angry, the, the cruel people. Help them. If that's your choices, no problem. If you help them, I do not want you to help my servants, the rabbis, the kids that learn Torah. No. It's either this or this. You have to make up your mind. And that's what happened to us sometimes. It happens to us. We want to help somebody, and we choose the wrong person to help. And in the end, we think we made a mitzvah. When we come to Shammai, we'll see we, we helped him to make sins. We gave him money to put gas in his car, to drive on Shabbat, to go against Hashem. We think we're helping him. We actually make it worse for him, but we're not aware of it. Why? Ignorance. The Torah says that Moshe Rabbeinu was informed by God that he is not going to enter the Holy Land. It's a famous story. Moshe started to beg God 515 prayers. Give me just a little opportunity to step in the Holy Land. God says, no, you cannot enter. He begins to pray every day, praying for days, for days, for weeks. God says to him, get on the mountain, I'm going to show you the land and the entire generations that are going to live in the Holy Land until the time Mashiach will come. Moshe Rabbeinu see a prophecy, what's going to happen from then until this moment? He saw what happened in Israel today, what happened yesterday, everything he saw. Then the Torah say, God showed him what happened in hell. He looked, he showed him what happened over there. What's the punishment of the people who rebel against God? The Torah said, Moshe started to shake. He almost got a heart attack. He was shaking. The Torah said, only when God told him, relax, you are not going to pass through that place. That's the only time when he relaxed. Until God told him. But before, Moshe, the most righteous person ever lived. He was afraid. Who knows where I'm heading to? Where am I going when he saw what's happened over there? Now I want to ask you a question. God already promised you you're not going to hell. God already promised you you're going to heaven. Relax. What do you need to beg him to live in the Holy Land? Big deal. What are you going to do there? Eat steak? Eat potatoes and rice? Gondi? What are you going to eat? For that you're willing to give up heaven? God is telling you I'm taking you to heaven. 
The Torah says, if you take all the physical pleasure of this entire world, of all the people combined, one hour in the world to come for the righteous Jews that follow the Torah, it's better than the entire pleasure of all the people together in 70 years. Just imagine the reward. There is no way for the soul here in a body to understand the huge reward for listening to the words of God and passing his test. The Torah is saying, and after these things, God tested Abraham. See clearly in the Torah, God is taking a righteous person. After 99 years, finally had a boy, and he come to him one day and say, Hey, Abraham, take him and kill him. That's a test. Abraham could have told him, Well, God, you went out of your mind. Excuse me, what? You promised me that that's going to be my only son. He's going to inherit me. I waited for him for so long. You gave me such a jewel. Now you want to take him? It's not fair. He did not make a beep. He ran and on the way to kill him. Not only that, when Hashem told him, that's it, you passed the test. You won. He said, let me make a scratch. One cut that I know I did the mitzvah. He said, don't touch him. He was arguing, let me do something. He said, no. Moshe Rabbeinu is already promised that he's set for eternity. What does he need to live here for another year or two? To be here, it's a punishment. It's not a pleasure. So much tragedy, so much agony, so much aggravation, frustration, so much hard work to do. What's, the, well, what's this? It's not nothing compared to heaven. You know what? We've got to learn a lot from this. Moshe doesn't care reward, reward. No. God, let me, give me another opportunity to serve you. One more year, two more years, I want to serve you. What for? You pass the test. It's my pleasure to serve you. I feel I'm doing something important. I don't care reward. I'm set. I know I'm set. Keep me here to do more mitzvot. That's what Moshe asked. Leave me here. I want to learn more about you. I want to be able to serve you better. Maybe I'll elevate my level. That's what, that's what he cared about. That's why God loved him so much. Moshe, my humble servant. Torat zichru Torat Moshe Avdi. Remember the Torah of my servant Moshe. He didn't say remember of the Torah of my servant Cohen or Yitzchak or Avram, Moshe. Why? Because Moshe earned it. Moshe earned it. And that's the mission here. David HaMelech says, Ma avti Torah Kol hayom isichati. God, I'm in love with your Torah. All day, I'm speaking about it. Let's learn what he just said. You cannot come to God and lie to him, right? You can lie to your wife. You can lie to your neighbors. You can lie to your teacher. You can lie to your kids. You can lie to the whole world. You stand in front of God. What are you going to do? You pray now in the middle of Shemona. say, God, you know I gave a million dollars to the synagogue. Why are you doing it to me? <laughs> you know he didn't give a penny. You know anyone who's going to stand in front of God? God... I gave millions. Why are you took why you took away my money? What do you mean you gave me? You never gave a penny. What are you gonna lie to God? You can lie to everyone. And make a show. But with them? So David Amelech said to Hashem, Ma afti Torah Techa Hashem, I'm crazy about your Torah. I'm in love with your Torah. All day I'm speaking about it. From here what do we learn? That when you love something, this is what you're talking about all day. Some people talk about the Yankees all day. The Yankees, the game on Thursday. I have tickets every five minutes. I have tickets for the Yankees. That's his life, the Yankees. For that he lives. Another person speaking all day about what? About his business. We're going to expand. We buy next door. We have another building coming next. That's his life. One person speak about politics all day. We'll do this, we'll do that. America, Poland, Russia, what's going to be... That's his life. And one person speak all day about Torah. What's the reason I'm talking about the Torah all day, David HaMelech say? Because I love your Torah. You talk about the girl that you met, you want to marry her all day, all you're talking to your parents is about her. Why? You love this girl, you want to marry her, so you talk about her all day. There is a mohel in Tel Aviv, his name is Abu Av. For 30 years, he was a famous moel. He's making bris, circumcision. One time, we get a phone call 
from a woman from the north of Tel Aviv, the anti-religion neighborhood of Israel. The fancy high society communist lives in that place. He gets a phone call. Rabbi, I need you to come to my house tomorrow morning to circumcise my son. The rabbi says, very good, where? She gives, she gives him the address. What time? 7.30 in the morning. The rabbi was impressed, why? Usually in Israel, the people make circumcision at 2 or 3 for everyone to come. Bring a band, food, nice, beautiful party. Well, you at 7.30, nobody comes. 2 o'clock, people just woke up an hour ago, they come. So, so, so the rabbi was impressed. Non-religious people, 7.30 in the morning? He said, okay, I'm coming. Next day he comes, 7.30 in the morning, he comes to the airway, I see a private, beautiful house, driveway, no cars. One car in the driveway, he doesn't see cars. He said, what, there's no, maybe, I, maybe you should give me the wrong address. I'm here already, let me knock the door. He knock on the door, he see a fancy lady open the door. Oh, Rabbi, you're just on time. She's with her phone running around the house. Hey, what's, I'm on my way out to work, my husband already left an hour and a half ago, and I have to run. So you have 600 shekel on the kitchen table in the envelope, and the baby is in the bedroom. Just do me a favor. Now it's 7.30. The, the maid coming at 8. So just stay with the baby until 8 if you don't mind. Once the maid comes, you can leave. Goodbye. And she left. But before she left, she told him, you know, I've been arguing with my husband for the last seven days, because now it's the eighth day, if we should circumcise him or not. Then my husband said to me, you know what, let's have mercy on him. He's going to go to the army, he's going to the public showers, people will look at him, you know, he's going to be embarrassed. So let's do it. We, know, we don't care religion, not religion. Let's just do it and that's it. One day, whatever, maybe we'll save him an aggravation or embarrassment. That's the reason they circumcise him. So the rabbi Abu Av goes to the room, he sees a baby over there. The first time in his life he makes a breeze with one person, him. So he's the sandak, he's everything, <laughs> and he made the breed. After the breed, what do you need? The baby begins to scream. The baby needs his mother after the breed. So he takes from the cup of wine, he put in the mouth of the baby. Ten minutes it helped. Then what? The baby screams. So he says, I was holding the baby, me and him crying for half an hour. He's crying <laughs> for his pain, and I'm crying how low the Jewish nation arrived. So I'm crying for the Jewish nation, and he cries for his pain. And we're both standing like this, my tears go on his face, his tears go on my face, up until the, the, the maid showed up. Thirteen years later, thirteen years later, he get a phone call. Rabbi, oh, Baruch Hashem, it took us a long time to find you. Yes, remember me, thirteen years ago, you came to my house to circumcise my son in the morning? Yeah, 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 I'm the one, yes. I don't know, our son is crazy. We got him all the psychology, psychiatrists, anything you can think of. It's already a month, he doesn't stop saying that he wants to leave the school and wants to go to religious school. He wants to go to yeshiva. I say to him, what, what happened to you? Tell us, something happened, explain. No, don't argue with me. You live your life, let me live my life. I want to go to learn Torah. They got him. Everything is fine. So there's nothing, nothing wrong. Can you find him in yeshiva? We don't know about these things. So he got him. He, found, he put him in yeshiva. He grew up to be, Baruch Hashem, black hat, big tzaddik. So he said, what was the schut of this boy that he got, when he got finally to Bar Mitzvah, Hashem had mercy on him. He brought him spirituality to his heart to wake up. He needs schut from Hashem. David Amelech all his life, every day was begging God to open his eyes to see more the truth. And to follow the truth. Not only to see, to see sometimes the Torah says, laem velo iru. The fact that you have eyes doesn't mean you see. The fact that you have ears doesn't mean you hear. Sometimes you hear what you're not supposed to hear and sometimes you see the things wrong. So, because he was standing over there crying for him, and the baby had nobody to take care of him. Hashem said, you know what, such a baby, I'm going to take care of him. Thirteen years later, the baby became a tzaddik. Why? Because of the tears of this Moel. He said, that's the first time in my life I felt 
very special to do this breed because of the agony and the pain that I had got into the mitzvah when a person does mitzvah with all his heart it's much much greater when he does it half and half then the Torah says Sas anochi al imratech kemotze shalal rav Sas in Hebrew means I'm very happy Sas anochi I am very happy you, say, you hear it in the Brit Milah. They always say, Sas anochi al imrotech, kemotze shalal rav. I am so happy to mention your Torah like finding a treasure. How a person is happy if you walk in the street, he say, you find a, a bag of diamonds. How happy he is, he runs, he screams, he makes phone calls. One guy told his friend, Ruven, I want you to do me a favor. Take this bag. Take it all the way up to the mountain. I know it's very hard. Do me this favor. So, okay, you know, you're a nice guy. I'm going to help you out. He took the bag. After 10 minutes of walking, climbing the mountain, his back is breaking. He put the bag on the floor. He sits on the rock, and he's very angry now. He begins to throw rocks. What a fool I am. Why am I always volunteering? Why did I take this heavy bag? What, what's the point now? I'm going to have to go two hours now all the way up to the mountain. I'm sweating. My back hurts. The guy that sent him... He's watching him all, all along, it's, you know, he's climbing the mountain. He knew that it's going to be a few minutes until he gives up. He calls his cell, he takes his cell phone out, he says, Yes, Ruven, one little thing I forgot to tell you. When you get to the top of the mountain, my friend Moshe over there is going to take one diamond, and all the rest of the diamonds are all yours for the efforts that you helped us to do such a great thing. What happened now to Ruven? He hang up the phone, he calls his wife, Rachel, the luckiest day of our life. Now it's not heavy anymore, it's not hot anymore, the sweat is delicious water, he's drinking his sweat, <laughs> everything. He's back, all of a sudden he doesn't have a disc, slide disc, all these things. He begins to dance, he goes up and down. What are you doing? You're working very hard. What work? Oh, it's, it's very cold, air conditioned in a desert. What's changed? What changed? The bag is the same weight. The back is the same back. Everything is the same. Nothing changed except one. Ignorance is no longer here. He just found out that I'm earning every step. Until now, I was doing it for someone else. I'm an idiot, a fool. I'm doing it for him for free. Ah, now it's for me? It's war to sweat. That's the difference between a non-religious Jew and a religious Jew. What change? The religious Jew, it's also hard for him. The same way is hard for the non-religious non Jew. There's only one difference. Why is doing it with passion, with happiness? He knows I'm earning every second. God is not a liar. God is not a member in the Israeli Knesset, with all the respect. When he promised in the Torah, I will reward you for eternity... He meant every word of what he said. And he didn't say it once or twice. Tens of places in the Torah. I'm testing you to see if you're going to follow my orders or not. I'm testing you to see if you love me or not. What for? That I should reward you in your end. Where is that end? You found any special department that the righteous Jews, close to the end of their life, they go to an island and get their reward? No. Where is that end? In your end means when you leave the material world, your test is over, you begin to cash on what you earn. Someone who cook on Friday, the Gemara says, will have what to eat on Shabbat. Thank you very much. For that I need Torah. My little two years old baby knows it. If your mother put the chulent on the fire on Friday, you have Shabbat morning, what to eat? She forgot to put the chulent, you have nothing to eat. For this you need Torah. Everybody knows it. What's the secret? The world is six days. Six days of creation. Six thousand years, that's it. Someone who works in the sixth day of the creation in this world will have what to eat in the seventh day, which is a spiritual day. What is it? After the world will be over, you go to a place, life of eternity. Either you earn it, or God forbid, the entrance is blocked for you. You cannot enter. 
The Torah says to us, pay attention now to every word. אלו המצוות אשר יעשה אותם האדם וחי בהם. Those are my מצוות that a person should practice, should do, that he should live. And another place. If you follow my Torah, if you follow my test and my law, and you do it, not only in the heart. Rabbi, I'm religious in my heart. My grandfather was a rabbi in Iran. Thank you very much. Your grandfather is in a very important place, and you will see. <laughs> my grandfather was the, the mullah in Iran. You know, when he walked, even the Muslim was standing like this. Yeah, your grandfather earned it. That's why he's in a very nice place. <laughs> Nobody said that you're going to go there. You cannot inherit to you his place over there. You have to earn. You have to earn. You don't earn, nobody will do it for you. Im en anili. Mili. If I don't take care of it, nobody will do it for me. Not my wife, not my children. Some people, they're very busy. They make millions of dollars. Before they die, they remember to be righteous. So they write, give a million dollars to the yeshiva of this rabbi. Two million dollars to the kolel. Three million dollars to the, to the cities of Rabbi Mizrahi to make more people religious. He has a list. His son says, yeah, yeah, sleep well, take all the millions. He buy an apartment in Manhattan, a yacht in Paris, five jet skis. He wants the rabbi, the CDs, his son with his earring here. He wants to enjoy life. Now his father is eating his heart. Hey, I told you what to do with the money. Why didn't you do it when you were alive? Don't you know that when you do something, you do it? Nobody else will do it for you. <laughs> when you had it, you could have done it. Why you remember an hour before for somebody else to do it? Maybe he will, maybe he will not. One guy came to the rabbi and said, Rabbi, before I, when I die, I want you to make sure in my funeral that I'm going to be buried with a long, warm coat and $5 in my pocket. <laughs> Rabbi said, that's an unusual request. Why? He said, I know what's going to be. In the resurrection of the dead, when I finally come back to life, as the prophet promised, it could be a freezing weather. <laughs> I want to make sure I have a coat. And I want to have five dollars to buy a warm cup of coffee, a coffee. Why? Because my children won't give me a coat. And they will not, they will, they will not care about getting me a coffee. So the rabbi told him, don't worry, you don't need the five dollars and the coat. <laughs> you can pass on it. He said, why? He said, you're not going to resurrect in the resurrection of the dead. He said, God forbid, rabbi, why are you saying this? He said, if this is the children you're leaving here, you don't deserve to recover. You fell big time. If you left children that won't worry to get you a coat and five dollars to have a cup of coffee, what? Who are you? You gave your children the worst education. Children don't care to get you something warm. You want to resurrect in the resurrection of the dead? What's the prophet say? Only the righteous people resurrecting. Not everybody. Someone who deserves to resurrect. What do you think? It's a price for everyone? The righteous and the wicked will get the same reward? Where is the justice of the Torah? The Torah says, I'm the God of justice that will not receive any bribe and will not prefer one from the other. Everyone will be judged exactly according to what he achieved. Now you come and you completely disprove the Torah. Why? Hey, Rabbi, don't be fanatic. We all Jews. Call Israel. I heard that a million times already. Rabbi, the Mishnah say, call Israel, every Jew has a part of the world to come. Why you say that some will have and some will not? I'm sorry, I just read the rest of the Mishnah. You cut it in the middle. <laughs> what? Call Israel, yesh laim chelek laolam haba, shenemar. And what's the rest? Ve'elu hen, shen laim chelek laolam haba. And those are the ones who have no part of the world to come. The Mishnah continue. Why they don't say it? Because we don't say it in a davening. In a davening, we take the good part from the, from the Mishnah, not the entire Mishnah. <laughs> Cut it in the middle, because we don't want to tell God, and those are the Jews who have no part of the world to come. In the middle of the davening, you come to be nice to Hashem, to ask. You don't mention bad things. So I want to ask you a question. The Torah says, you should know today that a person does not live thanks to the bread, thanks to the food. He lives 
thanks to the words of God, what came out of God's mouth in Mount Sinai. That's what the Torah says. And then the Torah says, if you follow my laws, that you should live. Those are the mitzvot that a person should keep, that he should live with that. I want to ask you a question. Ahmed doesn't live. Chris doesn't live. Itzik in Tel Aviv with five earrings in his earring and 500 tattoos driving on Shabbat to the beach smoking uh, drugs. He doesn't live. He has a million dollar company. Make a million dollar a day. He lives. Maybe better than me. No, so what the Torah says? Every time the Torah spoke about life, guarantee it's life of eternity. God doesn't call life your life. That's the mistake of many people. Whenever God said, listen to my laws and my order that you should live. What do you mean? The dog is also alive. And he doesn't keep your mitzvot. The goyim, the non-religious Jews, they're also alive. Don't be a fool. That's not life. That's a blink of the eye. That's a test. Test will be over in two hours. What's going to be after? That's what we care. The test of being a doctor or not, it's only two, three, four, five hours. That's it. And it's over. What's going to be after that? 50 years of career. Doctor, money, prestige, fame. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the test? Two hours test? No. That's why the Torah says... I swear in my name, I'm telling you all these six days, it's still not late to fix. Six days before the judgment day, thing, people can tell things around. The Torah says, I swear on my name. I'm not interested to execute the debt. Rather, he should make repentance that he should live. I never saw that you can kill a dead body. If a person is dead... What's the point of saying, I'm not interested to kill the dead? He's dead already. What do you mean? From here we learn that a person that is disconnected from God's Torah and from God himself, he has no faith, no emunah, no nothing in his life. He just lives like a goy, does whatever he wants, eats whatever he wants, never pray, never keep Shabbat, never say bracha, never appreciate what he gets, cares, steal, cheat, all kinds of things that we do sometimes. A person like this is in a category of the deceased people in the eyes of God. It's not considered alive. Why? God says in the Torah, I am not interested to kill the dead. Rather, he should re return from his bad way that he should live. Now we, from here we learn, life is forever. Death, God forbid, is also forever. The question is, what do you want to choose? I'm giving you the life and the good, the bad and the death, and you should choose, choose. It's in your hand 100%. You should choose the good. That means you can choose the bad. Just before time is running out, the Torah says that the nation of Israel got blessed with three crowns. Crown of Keuna, Kohanim, it's a special family, whoever is a Kohen. A crown of a king, King David, King Solomon, King Hizkiyahu, and many other kings. And a crown of Torah. From the three crowns, which crown is the most important? The crown of Torah, the crown of Keuna, or the crown of the king? The Torah said the crown of Torah. The Rambam writes, the Keter Torah is the most important one. If you come to a woman and say, excuse me, Mrs. X, we want to make your husband the king of the United States. The king. It's going to be the king. But you know, once your husband will become the president, the king, he's not going to have that much time for you. You know how politics is. Business, business meeting until midnight, running around, going here, going there, going to Europe, going to Israel, working with his advisor. He's not going to have time to breathe. Right now he comes home at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, you see your husband every evening. Your husband's going to be the, the king. You're going to live in a palace with servants and all that, but you're not going to see your husband that much. What is she going to say? No problem. Go for it. I'm 100%. You, you sure? No hesitation? No problem. Make my husband a king. And when the husband is not home, you're not going to hear one complaint from her. 
What are you talking about? My husband is the king. But when her husband tells her, I want to go in the evening to learn Torah in a kolel. Oof, I never get to see you. What's this? This Torah destroying our life? <coughs> Hashem said, the crown of the Torah is more important than the crown of a king. No, crown of the king, I see cash right away. You understand the difference? The crown of the Torah will give me the cash later on. I rather a dollar today than a million dollar tomorrow. The Torah says, Hashem said, Al ma'avda aretz. Hashem sent us the prophet. The prophet said these words, Al ma'avda aretz. Why the nation of Israel got destroyed? The destruction of the two temples. Al ozva me torati, because they left my Torah. They are not interested. They left the Torah. You should know. What's, the, what's mutual to diamonds and the Torah? There's something in mutual. For the, something in common. Torah and diamonds. When a person buys a one carat diamond, let's say it's $5,000. Let's say. If he wants to buy now a two carat diamond, it should have been $10,000. $5,000 became ten. If he wants to buy four carats, it should be 20,000. If he wants eight carats, it should be what? Double. Um, every carat, double the price. No. One carat is 5,000. Two carats is 20,000. Four carats is 100,000 already. Why? That's the Torah. When a person learns an hour a day in the morning, he goes to rest two hours, and then he learns another hour. And then he rests two hours, and he learns another hour. Three hours a day. His friend learned two hours straight. Who is better? Two hours straight is more than an hour, an hour, and an hour. What is it like putting pot with water to boil? You put it on the, on the fire, you need 10 minutes for it to boil. You put it for two minutes, you take it off. Two minutes, take it off. Two minutes, take it off. Two minutes, take it off. All day like this. Never boils. The Torah, it's like a snowball. One hour equal X amount of reward. Two hours straight, it's not double. It's much more. Three hours, it's much, much more. The more, the better it is. That's like diamonds. One carrot, it's not, two carrots is not double than one carrot. It's much more. If we knew the Torah, it's like diamonds, we would appreciate the Torah. The problem is we have no idea what the Torah is. Why? And we never read the Torah. If we would read what God spoke about this Torah, the reward that a person that's connected to the Torah is going to earn, he will never leave it for a second. King David, the king of the world, the king of the world is begging God, let me go to Yeshiva. Shivti bevet Hashem kol yemechayai. I'm begging you, give me the chance to sit in your home all my life. No palace, no nothing. Just let me sit and learn Torah. Why? It's the best earning. The best earning. Then, the prophet Yirmiyahu come and say like this. Ha-Kohanim lo amru haya Hashem. The Kohanim that serves in Bet HaMikdash, didn't say, where is God? They did not seek for him. And those who are learning Torah didn't really know who I am. How can it be? If those who sit in yeshiva all their life don't know who is Hashem, what's Hashem, what do you expect from the people on the street? Sometimes a person, a person can sit all his life in yeshiva and he doesn't achieve almost nothing. You gotta do it with all your heart. That's what the Torah says. In everything you can give. And that's what I said before. Potential, that's what you're being judged on. When a person comes in front of Hashem after 120 years, they showing him two movies. The movie of his life, and I have a lecture life after life. You can go into my website, see the goyim. Testify what happened to them after they died. And they came back to life after an hour, after half an hour. What did they see in this hour? That there was no pulse, no brain waves, no breath, no nothing. Completely dead for an hour. They already burned them with a cigarette. They didn't react. An hour later, they came back to life. 
seven years of my life, from the smallest detail, that it's completely not important, until the most important moment of my life, everything in chronological order. Two movies, one movie, what you really see, what you really achieve, and what you really did, for good and for bad. And the second movie, who you should have become. Imagine, just imagine the moment that God showing you that you selling gold in 47th Street, screaming all day, Kadima, half a price, today I'm in a good mood, or in a market selling watermelons, and then they show you that you could have been David Amelech, King David. You had the potential, very smart, you had a great soul. If you would uh, devote your life to the truth, you would become one of the most important people in the world. Just imagine the disappointment, before we're talking punishment, before we get into this, just imagine the disappointment for what you could have been and what you became. The embarrassment is the major, the most important punishment in the world to come before we're talking about the physical punishment is the embarrassment. And the person is going to see everything he did behind doors. Everything he did. One time in Israel, there was a wedding. In the middle of the wedding, in the last 10 minutes, the envelope with all the checks and the gift disappeared. Just imagine you made a fancy wedding, you have about $100,000 checks and cash in a bag, and it disappeared. The Chatan is running around, they call the police. Two o'clock at night, they check for the envelope, they can't find the envelope. A month later, the envelope is gone, what can they do? A month later, the video arrive. <laughs> the entire family sit together, like today we have a lot of people here, Baruch Hashem. Thank you to the family, thank you to Rachamim, it's an opportunity. People bother a lot to make a lecture. For us, it looks like what? You come, you see food, you see cake. People walk hours, and I'm not talking about the phone calls. To speak, it's easy. To arrange the lecture is a hundred times harder. But that's the greatest reward. Because the reward is go based on the efforts. My efforts is five hours efforts. Driving from one seat to here, driving back, speaking two hours, that's my effort. Their efforts is much harder. The fear, maybe people won't show up, what's going to happen? And when they expect 100 and only 50 show up, they eat their heart. For every little thing, God gives a huge reward. Nothing is a bigger mitzvah than to host a Torah lecture in the house of a person. You have no idea. What a huge reward. Bringing Jews to listen to the word of Hashem. I have no idea. And the one who really works is the one who arranges it. Advertisement, putting flyers, making phone calls, emails. That's the hard work. Going back. They watch the video. The entire family watch the video. And then the husband tells his wife, Hey, maybe we're going to see who stole the envelope. Five minutes later, in Israel, the wall, the, 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 the floor... Is wood, is a stone, not wood like here. Here, if a person falls on the floor, it's not the end of the world, it's soft floor. In Israel, it's very hard, <laughs> hard like a rock. After five minutes, they hear, boom, somebody fainted. They look around, the father of the bride fainted. Why? Ten seconds before everybody saw on the screen how he comes to the envelope, to the bag, like this. He grabbed it in, he puts it under his jacket and began to run. He ran to his car and he hid it. Then he came back, wow, where is the envelope? He's crying, well, well let's call the police. Now everybody saw. Just imagine, 10 seconds of embarrassment. He couldn't hold, he fainted. You cannot control when you faint, you know that. It's a spiritual punishment. You cannot, you cannot hold the, the shame, the embarrassment. Ten seconds! He almost got a heart attack and died from embarrassment. What's the proof? That embarrassment is a much more painful punishment than physical punches or physical uh, whip. What's the, what's the proof? I once came to a guy in the yeshiva. I said, oh, you look very nice today. He said, yeah, I'm going out on a date. Very nice. Hey, where are you going? To Brooklyn. You need at least a hundred dollars, no? So I told him, you have enough money? He said, yes. How do you have money? Young guy is learning Torah. 
He said, the rabbi gave me. So he said, I said, wow, very nice. I, I asked him, tell me, I want to ask you a question. When you took it from the rabbi, what did you feel? He said, big embarrassment. <laughs> what can I do? You know, they set me up on a date. I came to the rabbi. I said, rabbi, what am I supposed to do? I don't have money. <laughs> I don't have money. So rabbi said, oh, no problem. Then he goes to the account of the yeshiva. He gives me $100. So I told him, if I'm going to bring a machine to the yeshiva with a special glove that you put, you, press a, you put your head in, <laughs> it grabs your head, that you cannot run away, there's a special fist, he comes, you press a button, it gives you a punch to your forehead, you fall down on the floor, and right after that, a hundred dollars is falling, you pick it up, you don't have to, embarrass, to be embarrassed by the rough, you got a punch, you got a hundred dollars for that heavy punch. What would you do? Would you go to the Rav and ask him for $100 with no problem, no pain? Or you go to the glove to get to the machine to get a punch? So that's the question. Of course I go to the machine. <laughs> but if you're not convinced, did you ever see a, a boxing match? In a boxing match, two animals kill one another. <laughs> when finally one animal fell down on the floor, what's the first? Thing he always, but I mean always, check if I'm right or wrong. Better you don't check. It's better not to see it. But if you ever see it, remember me. After he's on the floor, he grabs the ropes over there and he gets up on his feet and he goes to the crowd like this. What's the problem? You're already 99% dead already. The hell is waiting for you. Come, come, uh, Chris. We're waiting for you. So now, Chris is getting up. He goes up like this. You know why? I wasn't defeated. I'm still standing. He's going to die because he got up. Not supposed to die. Your spine, your head. It's very dangerous to move in such situation. Who cares? Let me first avoid one minute of embarrassment. Goes like this. What do you see from here? That's what a person is doing just to avoid the embarrassment. The rest is nothing. Physical pain, he doesn't care. The embarrassment. It's the biggest thing. Sometimes a person comes to make a scene, a little ago you pass by. Vinny is running, jogging in the morning. How are you doing? <laughs> he saw him now, he was about to break somebody's windshield to steal something, but this guy, guy just saw him a minute ago, he said, you know what, if I'm going to break it, he's going to see police tomorrow, he's going to know that it's me. Even though he'll never see me again, I'm not from here. Just the embarrassment that one guy will remember my face, I'm not going to do it. I'll go to somewhere else and I do it there. The next day he comes to smash the, door, the, wheel, the glass, a little kid comes and stares at him. Like this. Go, go, go to mommy. Here, take candy. You throw candy to the other side of the street. The kid doesn't want to go. What happened? He said, okay, I won't do it. The next day he comes to, do, to make a scene, a dog. A dog is staring at him, like this, with two, two black eyes, angry dog looks at him like this. He tried to get the dog away. The dog doesn't want to go. He does not have the heart to make the scene in front of the dog. After 120 years, each one of us going to face God's reality. That's it. Now you have to be judged. For good, for bad, every beep you made in your life now on the screen. It will come to this moment, God will tell you, you fool, a dog is more imper important to you than me. In front of the dog, you were embarrassed not to make the scene. But with me, you don't even care about me. I give you oxygen for a hundred years. I gave you food for a hundred years. I gave you a wife. How many people never find a wife? It's an epidemic today. Many people die single today. It's the problem of this generation that the Jews have. Finally, they find a wife. 15% of the Jewish couples are barren. Cannot have children. They have no idea what's going on. Finally, they have kids. Almost each family have at least one cancer case. Almost every family. My cousin, my uncle, my brother. Almost everyone. Every day I get uh, text messages. Three, four, five, ten. For this kid, for that girl, for this husband, for this wife, for this mother. Epidemic. Growing like crazy. Finally you survive. 
Not once in 70 years you thought, God is so great to me. What do I do with the intelligence you gave me? I use it against you. What do I do with the money you gave me? I use it against you. Until we need the president of Iran to come and give us a speech in the United Nations, how bad we are to God and how we don't listen to him. Listen to his speech from today. Why God is doing it to us? We don't even have the zchut to hear the truth from the, from the good, righteous people. We have to hear it from the most despicable murders that plan to murder millions of innocent people. He comes to read the Torah to us. From him, we're listening, because we're interested to see what the president of Iran has to say. When the rabbi comes to speak in great neck, oh, again. No, this rabbi scares me. No, he's too strong. I come to the lecture, two months I'm depressed after. <laughs> What's better? To be depressed and get rid of your disease or to be happy and die? What's better? Rabbi, in the meantime, I'm very happy. He's falling from the Empire State Building. How are you doing, Moshe? So far, so good. <laughs> Rabbi screamed to you from the window, Moshe, so far, so good. Two minutes from now, it will be very bad. I'm trying to save you. The doctor tried to save the patient, if he's a good doctor. If he's a bad doctor, he just want to take for the visit for, the, for, for him to come. Extra here, extra day, take this, take, sell him medicine, let him die. What do I care? In the meantime, three, four months, I make money of him. That's a bad doctor. That's a murderer. A rabbi that stands next to a Jew, that live and rebel against God, and doesn't tell him anything. Just give me donation, donation. We want to build a new building. We want to give me money, give me a million dollars, help me. Give me, give me for that, give me for that. What about keeping Shabbat? Why you never got him to the side and spoke to him 15, 20 minutes? He is putting himself in a huge jeopardy. It's almost like killing a person. If you see a Jew is drowning in a river, you have an opportunity to save him and you ignore him? I, won't, I will leave you alone. Just give me your money. What is this? They put you in jail for the rest of your life, like a murderer. I didn't kill him, but you could save him. You let him die. What's worse? To let him die for 20 years? He's 60. He would live another 20 years. Or to let him die for eternity? The doctor can only save you 20, 30, 40 years if they give you the right treatment. A good rabbi can save your eternity. If he changes your point of view about life, if he proves to you the purpose of life, if he shows you that the Sabbath is an eternal covenant between us to the Creator of the world, and the reward for that is endless, and the punishment for that is, God forbid, if you read in the Torah what it says, V'nichreta nefesh haim Yisrael, and that soul will get cut out of my nation permanently. I want to, I'm almost fainting just by saying it. And I keep Shabbat. And people who sit here who maybe doesn't do it, they think, ah, what is he saying? It's, it's too hard. It's not like this. It cannot be. I'm only reading. I did, I did not design the Torah. The Torah says 12 times, not once. The more times it repeats in the Torah, the more serious is the crime. That shows that God is very precise about this. Twelve times. There's only one thing in the Torah that mentions more times than the Sabbath, than Shabbat. What is it? To, to love and respect the converts. Thirty-six times. Not to steal from them, to help them. All kinds of things. Why? Because in your eyes, he's a goy. What? Who is this guy? He just came from the Italian church. Uh, 20 days ago he was kissing Maria on her head and now he came to, to tell us what to do in a synagogue. The convert suffers a lot. Not fairly. People have, people are prejudiced. Almost everyone is prejudiced, not realizing it. Jews are prejudiced against Jews. It's needless to say they'll be prejudiced against non-Jews. They don't even know them. They're not a part of our family. I'm prejudiced against my cousin. You expect me not to be prejudiced against Vini and Bruce Lee? <laughs> That's why God said it so many times in the Torah. Be careful. Once he converted, he's your brother. A few more minutes before we finish. The Torah says, 
Remember this when you go to the synagogue on Rosh Hashanah. Pnei Hashem, I'm translating. Pnei Hashem Beosera, the face of Hashem is following the wicked Jews. Leachrit Me'eretz Zichram, to erase their memory from earth. Tsaku, they scream, they scream, the Hashem Shomea, they scream, God, no, help me. Let, me, let me become righteous, give me another chance. They scream, real scream, from the heart. The Hashem Shama, Hashem is listening. What comes right after? Shocking. Umikol tsarotam hitzilam. One scream with all his heart. One scream. A second ago, look at the verse. Hashem is searching. Searching for the wicked people who is going to erase from the face of the earth next. He came to that person. In five minutes from now, this person is finished. His entire ear is going to be chas v'shalom, the worst. But he screams with tears. Hashem listened to his scream. Umikol tsarotam itzilam. And he saved him from all his problems. Not from one or two problems. All his problems. He's not married. He will get married this year. He doesn't have parnasa. I'll give him parnasa. He doesn't have children. He'll get children. He was supposed to be dead in two months from now from all his sins. I reap the verdict. One scream, one good prayer from all his heart, with tears. The Tehillim that we read so many times, we're not always paying attention to the words. What does it say? Karov Hashem lechol korav. Hashem is very close to those who call him. Lechol asher ikra'u be'emet. But only to those who really call him. Sometimes a person comes to Yom Kippur to the synagogue, Chatanu, Avinu, Pashanu, we cheat, we stole, we betrayed you, we rebel against you, we made other people make sins, we didn't keep Shabbat, we spoke Lashonara, we did sex crimes. We, we, his, his heart is already a million pieces already from, the, from this feast. Oh, this, this, okay, no. Oh, I should say, okay, no problem. I listen, I saw it. You don't have to tell me. I know it. It's important to say it. It's a part of repentance. What's next? That's, that's the main question in that moment. Okay, I heard. Okay, fine. Let's make a plea bargain deal. What's next? What, what do you mean next? Shabbat, we have picnic with the family. We barbecue. <laughs> we already invite uh, Jose and Amigo to barbecue for us in the backyard in Great Neck. So why did you come on Wednesday on Yom Kippur to say, Hashem, we, we didn't keep Shabbat. He already in his mind in that second thinking how many pounds of chish kebab I should buy. Juje kebab, whatever, gondi. <laughs> Just imagine yourself sitting with Hashem in a court of heaven and watching this guy. I'm sorry, I don't keep Shabbat. And on the screen, how many pounds of lamb we should get for the shish kebab on this coming Shabbat? What's a person like this going to get? A discount on his punishment? Or probably his punishment will get worse? What do you think? Let's be honest. Simple common sense. You do it, do it right. You don't do it, why you come to lie? Yom Kippur was not given to come and stand in front of guy and lie. Sometimes there are parts in the prayer that doesn't come out of my mouth. Like there's a part in the to in a davening after the Shmona Yisrael that it's a part from Tehillim that it says, Ki chasid ani. Who wrote it? David HaMelech. David HaMelech was chasid. Chasid is the highest level of a righteous Jew. Greater than righteous. The highest. Perfect. Sometimes when I say it in the davening, I hesitate. How can I say this? I say it's a part of the davening. I have to read it. But I feel so terrible reading it. I'm a chasid. You know what chasid is? How can you say these words? To be a liar? 
So then I comfort myself. I say, Hashem, you know, if it would be up to me, I wouldn't read it. But it's a part of the davening. I'm thinking in my head. Why? Embarrassed to say it. Why to lie? David HaMelech said to Hashem, Oreni Hashem Darkecha, please God, show me your ways. Please show me your ways. Alech Be'amitecha, that I'm going to find your truth. Not my truth, not my teacher in college, not my parents' truth. We all people, we don't know the truth. Areni Hashem Darkecha, show me your ways. Ve'alech Be'amitecha, that I will enter your truth. David HaMelech said, do not be a, a horse and a mule. Why from all the animals, David HaMelech chose the horse as an example? He said to us, don't be a horse. Why? What's so special about the horse? Two things about the horse are unbelievable. When, uh, when you ride a horse, what happens when you hit him? He runs faster. Why the horse knows that when you hit him, he has to run faster? If any, he should have stopped. When, so when you run, and somebody runs after you and hit you, you stop. What do you want? Hey, get nervous, no? Why is he running after me? The horse, you sit on him, you hit him with a whip, he runs faster. You hit him again, he runs even faster. The horse, in his mind, it's not a genius, the horse. In his mind, he thinks, if I will run faster, I will avoid the pain. The heat that this guy is hitting me, I will escape from it. David HaMelech said to us, Dear Jew, don't be a horse. When Hashem took away your money, when Hashem got you in an accident, when something went wrong in your life, when your marriage is not successful, when you're 45 and you didn't get married, it's not coincidence. Don't avoid it, lying to yourself. Wake up. God is sending you a message. Wake up. Change that I can give you, that I can benefit you. So what does he do? Now he runs even faster from the truth. Stop. What do you say? Don't run like this and think that the problems will not come. Because what do you have to say? Tzara ve'yagon emtza. When a problem came to me, Uveshem Hashem Ekra. What do I do right away? Begin to scream to Hashem, help. I have a friend, if you realize right here in Middle Neck, Middle Neck Road, a week ago they opened a new store, Super Nuts. You saw that store? Beautiful, nice store. This guy that opened the store is one of the most important friends that I have. Since I came to America, I know him for 18 years. Maybe a year after I came here, I met him. When we were young, when the hair was still black, we went through a lot of nice things in our life. This guy has something about him we should all learn. Besides the fact that he's a tzaddik, he gives a lot of tzedakah and helps a lot of good things. One thing about him is when he has a problem, he goes into a room and begins to scream and cry to Hashem. And he told me, all my life, not once, when I went to the room and cried and screamed to Hashem, that he didn't listen to me. And I'm asking to myself, I do, probably, from the way it seems, a lot more than this guy is doing. I don't have the ability, like this guy, to go inside the room and scream like this, cry, like Meshuggah, like screaming to Hashem, and a minute later the problem is over with a miracle. Unbelievable. Why? That's what Hashem said. Lechol asher ikra'u be'emet. Karov Hashem, close to you. Just open your heart that I can enter. That's why we say in the davening, Lev tahor berali elokim. A pure heart create for me God. Veruach nachon chadesh bekirbi. And give me new spirit to get close to you. The greatest person ever lived, one of the greatest, David HaMelech, every second word from his mouth was this, show me a way, let me get close to you. And we, Rabbi, I'm a tzaddik. What do you want from me? Well, you know what a tzaddik I am? Just give $2 tzaddik every month. Big tzaddik I am. <laughs>
I stop smoking on Shabbat? Hashem loves me. You see what a nice house he gave me? Saddam Hussein has a nicer house than you. 